MLB is in a massive bubble, and when it bursts, it's going to change the league forever. But the cause of it may not be what you think. Of course, MLB is facing a ton of issues lately, between aging fans, lowering attendance, and fewer kids playing baseball. All of these pose a threat to MLB's future, but ironically, its biggest threat has also been its biggest moneymaker, local TV rights. To understand why, we first have to understand how we got here. Prior to 1980, most games got televised on local network affiliates, essentially your local CBS station. But this setup was far from perfect. For one thing, the broadcasts were only available within the local service area, which was usually just the metro area of the city. For another, not every game was televised. If there wasn't room on the broadcast schedule, the local game just wouldn't get shown. But with the rise of cable networks in the 70s and 80s, new ways of broadcasting games began to emerge. Superstations like WGN and TBS gave the Cubs and Braves a national audience. Channels like ESPN packaged the highlights of every game. And most importantly, regional sports networks began to compete with the national networks. At first, these networks only served the largest of markets. But throughout the 1980s, the largest groups would expand their territories around the country. Regional channels popped up in New York, LA, Atlanta, Chicago, and many others. But in the mid-1990s, a new player would enter the market and change the game forever. At the time, Fox was building up to compete with the major networks, and a key part of their strategy was live sports. In 1994, they got their first contract to broadcast NFL games, and MLB followed suit the very next year. Soon, they would also add college football, NASCAR, and the World Series to their roster, making them a huge player in the national sports scene. However, their biggest moves would be regional, not national. In just two years, they purchased control of Prime Sports, Sports Channel, and Sports South, the three largest RSN groups in the country. And with the launch of Fox Sports Arizona in 1996, the Fox Sports regional networks were born. The business plan was very simple. Fox used their resources as a national network to build monopoly in every sports market in the country. Each of their networks had already secured the broadcast rights to every one of their major teams in the region, and if they hadn't, it wasn't that hard to convince them. After all, every game would be televised, their broadcasts would go out to a much wider area, and Fox could offer way more money than any other competitor. This monopoly on live sports gave Fox a ton of leverage with cable companies, and this allowed them to charge extremely high fees to carry their networks. Needless to say, the Fox Sports networks were an instant success. At the time, it seemed like a win for everyone. Local fans could now watch every game on TV. Cable companies made live sports a huge part of their marketing. The networks made a ton of money from their ads and carriage fees, and a lot of that money went to teams and leagues, most notably MLB. Of all the major sports leagues in the US, none was more suited for RSNs than MLB. The league is very regional, has a ton of games to broadcast, and caters to a loyal fan base. Because of this, MLB had the closest relationship with the RSNs, and it made them a ton of money. In the RSN era, MLB earned more than ever before, tripling its yearly revenue since 2001, and the largest part of that growth was local TV rights. Today, every team makes $100 million before a pitch is even thrown. 60 million of this comes from the national TV deals, but local TV can bring in 40 to over $100 million each year. And for the biggest teams, that payday is even greater. Last year alone, the Dodgers got $200 million for their local rights, and their total TV money is almost enough to cover their insane payroll. These numbers were unthinkable just 25 years ago, but for the longest time, this growth has felt inevitable. However, if you're watching this video, you probably already know where this story is going. It's time to talk about Bally Sports. In 2017, Disney bought 21st Century Fox in one of the largest media mergers in history. At the time, Fox had the largest group of RSNs in the country, 21 networks with rights to 14 MLB teams. 
However, since Disney also owned ESPN, they were forced to sell the networks due to antitrust law. This opened up a huge opportunity, as whoever bought them would instantly become one of the most powerful companies in sports media. In early 2019, Sinclair Broadcast Group won the bidding war, buying the networks for a whopping $9.6 billion. With their joint ownership of Marquee and Yes Network, this gave them broadcast rights to over half of MLB. At the end of 2020, the network naming rights were sold to Bally's, a chain of casinos, resorts, and sportsbooks. And in March 2021, the networks officially rebranded as the Bally Sports Regional Networks. At first, people didn't like the change for various reasons. Some people hated their new presentation style. Some people didn't like the emphasis on sports betting. And still others just didn't like change in general. But soon, the real issue started to emerge. The RSN business was dying. With streaming on the rise, cable losing subscribers, and more options than ever to watch live sports, RSNs don't have the same power that they had at their peak. But Bally didn't understand this. One of their first moves after the purchase was to renegotiate their cable contracts. Even though they already had some of the highest fees in all of cable, they felt that they needed more money to justify their investment. But when they tried to strong arm the cable companies, it didn't go as planned. In many regions, Bally got dropped by Dish, YouTube TV, Hulu, and many other TV providers. Speaking from experience, if you wanted to watch the Diamondbacks in Arizona, there are only one or two providers that actually allowed you to do it. And looking at the fees they were demanding, it's really not that hard to see why. Eventually, that missing revenue added up. In March, Sinclair announced that Bally Sports was going into bankruptcy. And soon after, they missed payments to many of their MLB clients. Of course, MLB wasn't the only league affected by this, and we'll talk about that later. But they were the first ones forced to take action on it. By the All-Star break, Bally lost the rights to the Padres and the Diamondbacks. And fittingly, Bally Sports Arizona became their first network to shut down completely. And it's not just Bally either. Warner Brothers Discovery is shutting down their RSN business entirely. Some TV providers are putting RSNs behind even more paywalls. And a third of the league doesn't even know if their deals will still be here next year. In other words, the RSN bubble is popping. On the surface, this feels like a minor inconvenience. But behind the scenes, this is a huge threat to many MLB teams. And we're already seeing the effects of it during the current offseason. The biggest example has been the Padres, who were the first team to get dropped by Bally. In 2023, they had to take out $50 million in loans to cover their bills. And soon after, reports came out that they were going to slash their payroll. Even with record ticket sales in the past two years, San Diego didn't have the money to support their roster. And as a result, they had to start tearing it down. Blake Snell left as a free agent. Juan Soto got traded to the Yankees. And at the time of recording, they have yet to make any notable additions. As it stands, their payroll is now below 200 million. But with the Dodgers continuing to dominate and the Diamondbacks becoming actual contenders, it feels like their window is closing. And it's not just them. With an exciting young core and three straight winning seasons, everyone expected the Mariners to spend in 2024. And this included their GM, Jerry Depoto. But at the start of the offseason, fans were given some terrible news. Instead of increasing the budget, ownership forced Depoto to cut the payroll. In the span of about a week, Seattle gave up a third of their starting lineup in cost-cutting moves. And while they did sign Mitch Garver and get Mitch Hanniger back, they still have gaping holes at second base, third base, and corner outfield. This likely stems from issues with their team-owned network, Root Sports. While the team owns 70% of the network, the other 30% is owned by Warner Brothers Discovery. And with WBD leaving the sports industry, the network is going to look very different going forward. And if that wasn't enough, Comcast is now adding an extra paywall for the network, which will have huge effects on both viewership and advertising money. This has added a ton of uncertainty to Seattle's future, but more importantly, it's given John Stan an easy excuse to not spend money. This is something you'll hear from a lot of cheapskate owners in the coming years. And sadly for Mariners fans, it might destroy their hopes of competing in the AL West. Speaking of the AL West, the Rangers have been very quiet this winter. 
the reigning champions are likely about to get cut by Bally, and when that happens, they'll miss out on nearly $100 million a year. Now, most of this would be covered by MLB in the short term, more on that later, but this situation has likely made them very cautious. After spending a shit ton of money to win the World Series, Texas has done nothing to add to their roster. Granted, it's not like they needed to add much, but it's weird that they haven't gone after any free agents this year, especially with how aggressive they've been before this. But it's not all doom and gloom though. On paper, the Diamondbacks seem like they would be the most affected by this. They have one of the poorest owners in the league, a very fair weather fan base, and some of the lowest TV ratings in MLB. And in July, they became the second team to lose their RSN. However, this hasn't stopped them from spending this winter. After their World Series run, the D-backs have added nearly $50 million in payroll, trading for Eugenio Suarez, adding Eduardo Rodriguez, and re-signing Lourdes Gurriel Jr. But of course, time will tell if they continue to be aggressive. By the end of next year, the Pirates, Rockies, Twins, Guardians, and basically every other Bally Sports team could lose their RSN. And obviously, the affected teams are going to feel the pain. These TV deals were worth billions of dollars, and they were supposed to fund these teams for decades into the future. But the collapse of Bally doesn't just put the teams at risk, it also threatens MLB itself. Normally, teams running at a loss isn't that big of a deal. With MLB's revenue sharing, the teams with the lowest revenues get subsidized by the teams with the largest profits. That way, every team is able to stay above the water. But what happens if a huge chunk of MLB's revenue just suddenly disappears? In a rare moment of foresight, MLB did have a backup in place for Bally's downfall. Not only did they take over broadcasting and distribution, but they would also cover 80% of the money owed to the teams. But while this did help the Padres and D-backs last season, this isn't a sustainable strategy moving forward. Covering for one or two teams is one thing, but if half the league suddenly loses their TV revenue, that is way too big of a gap for MLB to cover. And part of the problem is that even compared to other sports leagues, MLB is extremely exposed here. MLB offers twice as many games as the NBA and NHL, and they are often the only source of content for RSNs during the summer. Because of this, MLB teams get way more money for their rights compared to their counterparts and local TV makes up a bigger chunk of their revenue. According to Forbes, MLB teams made over $10 billion last year, and about a quarter of that came from local TV. If that money is suddenly cut in half, that's a loss of about a billion dollars across the league. And even if you tax the hell out of the Mets, the Yankees, and the Dodgers, it's not even gonna come close to bridging that gap. In contrast, the NBA received a similar amount of revenue that season. However, they only got about half the local TV money, and their national TV deals were way bigger than MLB's. In other words, even though both leagues are getting screwed by RSNs, the NBA is in a way better spot to weather the storm. They took the opposite approach to MLB over the last 30 seasons. Instead of taking a national game and making it extremely regional, they took a regional game and made it a global one. And with their national TV deals, they won't lose any money or exposure going forward. But if MLB wants to dig out of this hole, they have a ton of work to do. Obviously, this is something we're going to be talking about for quite a long time. As it stands, the Bally bankruptcy is far from over. The long-term impacts are still not yet known. And of course, TV money is going to be a huge part of the next CBA negotiations. But let's say that MLB gets through all of this. What does the league's future look like? Well, for some teams, it may be a return to local affiliates. Ever since MLB took over, the Padres and Diamondbacks have been broadcasting on local TV, and both teams have seen a huge spike in their ratings since the shift. Part of the initial appeal of RSNs was that they allowed for a much wider broadcast, but with how much TV has changed in the last 20 years, and the huge paywalls that RSNs are put behind, Basic TV channels have a much wider range than any RSN now. And obviously, these channels won't bring in as much money, but giving people more access to the games could help teams grow their fan base in the future. Another option may be for teams to just buy out their RSNs entirely. In October, the Houston Rockets and Houston Astros came together to buy out their RSN, 
rebranding it as the Space City Home Network. We've seen teams build their own networks before. Yes Network for the Yankees, Marquee Network for the Cubs, MSG for the Knicks. But typically, this has only been an option for the biggest teams in the biggest markets. But with the landscape changing this much, it may be a better option for smaller market teams to take matters into their own hands. Or they could take the more radical option and dive headfirst into streaming. As I was recording this video, the news came out that Amazon is buying out Bally as part of their bankruptcy. And part of this deal means that some of these games are going to get broadcasted on Amazon Prime. For years, Amazon has been trying to break Prime into the live sports market. And while they do have Thursday Night Football, having live MLB games all throughout the year is a huge step forward toward their goals. Admittedly, I'm not quite sure how this is going to work yet. Will Amazon games be blacked out on MLB.tv? Will the games still be shown on regular TV channels? Will there be some sort of collaboration like MLS and Apple? I truly don't know because they really haven't given us any specifics yet. But for now, I'll just say this. It is going to be really interesting to see how MLB navigates this situation going forward. But with all that being said, I want to hear from you now. What do you think MLB should do about the ongoing RSN crisis? Let us know in the comments section down below. And if you like this video and you want to hear me talk more about MLB's bad business decisions, you should check out this video on Bud Selig. As always, thank you all for watching and we'll see you next time.